Good morning, Myrtle Springs and all the other people watching from other churches around the community. It's so good to have you with us here this morning at Myrtle Springs Baptist Church as we do one more service that is totally online and being uh, recorded and sent out to you guys on Sunday morning. And we're so excited about being able to come together even in a modified uh, way next Sunday morning. It's going to be great. We'll have two services and Brother Kyle will tell you more about that in just a few minutes. One of the things I just wanted to mention just briefly before we get started this morning is I hope all of you have had an opportunity to do what myself and my family have done during the times that we've been closed uh, and having to do this modified worship service. And that's to evaluate yourselves and, and your relationship with God and your obedience to God in regard to what he has called you to do. You know, God's word tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the other things that we enjoy and we need will be added unto us. And so I think during this time of, of this uh, stay at home that we've all experienced, if we'll evaluate our lives, we can all find ways that we had put certain things in our life before God. I kind of equate this to restarting a computer after you've had a problem with it. God's told us to reboot as Christians and as believers and so as we've rebooted, hopefully uh, God, as he uh, comes into our lives and our hearts and changes our spirits, will give us those updates that we need so that when we restart our lives, we can restart our lives committed to him, starting over afresh and anew with all systems working great and committed to what God has asked us to do. Christians, if we'll do that, you just watch and see how God blesses his church, how God blesses our community and how God blesses America. Join us as we stand together and sing, Standing on the Promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, Standing on the promises of God. Well, good morning. It is a great day, Mother's Day, and we just want to say a happy Mother's Day to all of our moms out there. Praise God for you. God bless you. Uh, we do wish that we could all be here uh, today in our sanctuary celebrating uh, you and the, and the blessing of God that you are into our lives, but uh, we do wish you a happy Mother's Day out there, and I uh, know that a lot of our moms and grandmas and, and others have, um, have been uh, having to do overtime the last few weeks, and uh, we certainly uh, praise God for that and thank you for all the things that you do uh, for our, our kids and grandkids and, and others. Yeah, we, we just are blessed uh, to have you all in our lives. I want to just um, give you a few announcements this morning. Uh, we will be, as Brother Kevin said, starting back with two services at 9 and 11 next Sunday, May 
17th, and we're excited about that. Uh, it will be a little bit modified, of course, here in the beginning, uh, but uh, we're excited about getting back in here with you all and uh, being able to have worship together and sing together and pray together and and uh, gather around the Word of God together. Uh, our first service at 9 will be for uh, age 60 plus. And so if you fall into that category, kind of that high-risk category, we want to be able to just uh, let y'all have your own service uh, there in the beginning. And uh, uh, so that'll be at 9, and uh, those below 60 will be at 11. As I said, don't overthink it. If, if, uh, if you are over 60, your spouse is under 60, hey, just, just pick and choose what you'd like to do. It's okay. But uh, that follow those guidelines as much as possible uh, if we can. We will observe, of course, social distancing and all of that. Try to uh, uh, be as, um, as a part as we can, even though we're gathered here uh, in this place. And so we're going to uh, just section off every other pew, and uh, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, to have distance between us all and, and, and observe all of the guidelines that are out there. But again, we're just glad to be able to come back uh, together and uh, we'll, we'll begin to loosen all of that as we, as we can uh, in the weeks uh, ahead. Also, youth will be back on Wednesday night, May the 20th. And uh, there's going to be a different schedule there. Also, middle school will come at 530 and high school will come at 7 o'clock. And so uh, back there in the youth room, May the 20th, Wednesday night, uh, that'll be back on. There won't be any food served. Uh, also, our adult Bible study will be back on May the 20th as well. We'll start that, of course, at 6, and uh, we can get in here and spread out, and all that will be, we'll be fine. We'll, but we'll get that back going again normally. And uh, as, as we're able to, to move forward with this, we'll be adding back in all the things that we, we normally have as we can. So just uh, kind of pay attention to the announcements that are coming on those things. But I do want to thank you for your faithfulness through all of this. You know, it, it's been, I mean, they don't teach you this in seminary, how to, how to handle a situation like this. And, and uh, so it, it's, been, it's been an interesting time. And uh, just, just learning from all of us as a staff, you know, being together and, and uh, just coming up with suggestions and learning from other churches and pastors that, that we have. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a, an interesting time. And I want to thank you all for being so faithful. Uh, during these days, uh, for watching and sharing and giving and just uh, being uh, a, a source of constant encouragement uh, in our lives. We do thank you uh, so much. But uh, I say all that to say this, come back next Sunday, and uh, we look forward uh, to that. So let's pray together this morning. Father, we're grateful this morning once again to come into this place and, Lord, to have this service now. God, we thank you on this special day that is Mother's Day that we set aside to, to honor the, the ladies that you have put into our lives. Lord, we praise God for all of those mothers in our lives. Lord, we, just, we know that they're a blessing from you and you have uh, designed a good thing when you designed a mother. And so, Lord, we thank you. Uh, for all of the blessings of our lives, especially those that uh, are coming from our mothers, Lord. We, uh, we just praise you today for all of the ways that you work in our lives, Lord, and our families. Father, we pray this morning that you would, uh, Lord, just impact our lives by the worship that we will um, to gather in together today. Lord, the prayers that we pray, the, the word of God that we will look at today, Lord, by your spirit. Uh, help us to become more like Jesus as we gather into this worship service today. Father, we pray that the days to come, Lord, you give us direction, uh, that you give us wisdom and guidance. Lord, we know that these last several weeks have been uh, difficult in so many ways, but Lord, we know that you have been um, our refuge, our protection, our, our ever-present help in our time of need. And so, Lord, we do give you praise for all of the ways in which you have worked and continue to work in our lives. And so, Lord, we, as we come back together next Sunday, we anticipate what you have been doing in this time of, of pause in our lives and what you will do in the days to come in our church and in churches around us. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have brought us back together and will bring us back together in the days to come. Lord, bless this time today. We pray that all that we do would glorify you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, it trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands.
deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hearts in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hearts in worship as we lift your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory. Praise God that He is great. He is greater than anything. He is greater than all of our sin, all of our problems, everything that comes against us in this world. God is greater, and He deserves all the praise for it. Let's take our, take our Bibles this morning and turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I want to talk to you this morning about while we wait, while we we wait. How many of you enjoy waiting? Probably not many of us uh, would enjoy waiting. Uh, probably not many of us uh, anticipate uh, having to wait for anything. Uh, waiting is one of the most frustrating things that we deal with in life. I'll just be honest with you. I, I don't like it, of course, but I really, really don't like waiting in traffic. Um, cannot stand waiting in traffic. I remember when, not long after I moved to Dallas, we got married, I moved to Dallas, and um, <clears throat> was coming home probably two weeks after we, uh, we moved in out in Bedford, where we were, and of course you know that area around the airport there is so bad traffic at rush hour, and uh, I, I, I just not dealt with that, you know. Um, uh, traffic on Pine Street in Arkadelphia is not the same as it is on uh, 635 in Dallas. And so, um, anyway, I just got frustrated coming home one day at, um, at rush hour. And I thought that uh, I was going to be smart, you know, and, and I could find a shortcut and just bypass all that traffic and get home quicker. Well, long story short, I ended up just a few miles from the Red River. Uh, no joke, I ended up just a few miles from the Red River. I had to call my father-in-law and say, I don't know where I'm at. And he said, well, I don't know where you're at either. And, and uh, it was back before GPS and all that, we didn't have that stuff. Hard to believe that was that long ago, but uh, we didn't have it. Didn't have it on my phone, didn't have a GPS in the car, didn't have anything like that. And so I told him where I was. He got me back home, guided me there and, and all of that. But I did all that. Because I couldn't wait. I just thought, I can't wait on this traffic. When I refused to wait, it took me more time than it needed to take me. You know, you know I think most of the time when we are required to wait, we, we automatically assume there's no purpose in it whatsoever. When we're, when we're in traffic, we may uh, be in traffic because the road's getting fixed up there ahead of us and it'll be safer for us to travel when we get to that place. When we're put on hold, if you're talking to somebody on the phone, you get put on hold, we get frustrated about that, but it may be that that person on the other end of the line is talking to other people about how to fix the problem that we came to them with. All kinds of things that can be seen in the waiting times of life. We, there's a purpose in waiting so many times. And what we find in Scripture is that God often requires us to wait, and there is always a purpose behind it. Let me give you the key takeaway this morning. While we are waiting, God is working. Every time. While we are waiting, God is working. In Acts chapter 1, you, you have a time of waiting. 
In verse 4, Jesus had told them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. Now this verse, verse 4, it's kind of insignificant if you're just reading past it. You know, you're reading chapter 1 and you think, okay, we just tell them to wait. That actually governs all of chapter 1. This verse, verse 4, governs the whole chapter. Uh, there would be a period of waiting before the Holy Spirit came. Now we ask the question, and as, as I have too, I thought about this, why would Jesus not send the Holy Spirit immediately upon his ascension? Why did they need to wait? Why, what was the purpose uh, about all of that? Well, we're going to see some of those purposes here in just a moment, but why didn't he just do that? Why didn't he just uh, uh, give the Holy Spirit right then and there? Well, the Bible doesn't really give us an answer to uh, why there was a waiting period, but these believers do teach us how to be faithful during the time of waiting. There were some things that the Lord wanted them to understand. They, he wanted them to experience in this waiting period. And I want to give you three things that we see they did in this passage. And these are three must-dos in life when we are waiting on the Lord. Whenever God has you in a waiting experience, these are must. First, when you find yourself waiting, believe the Lord's promises. When you find yourself waiting, believe the Lord's promises. Look at verse 10 of Acts chapter 1. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now we talked last time in the previous passage about the ascension of Jesus and the fact that Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father. When Jesus ascended, this, this experience here in Acts chapter 1, when he got into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. But we didn't talk much about this promise that's given to us here in verses 10 and 11. But there's a promise right here of the return of Jesus Christ. The angel that was, was there with the disciples said, This Jesus whom you are seeing right now, whom you saw go into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. He's going to come back once again. If you remember, they had been very concerned about him setting up a kingdom on the earth. And, and Jesus told them, don't focus on all that right now. It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set out. You, here's, your, here's your responsibility. Be a witness for me. That's what he told them in Acts 1 and verse 8. But this right here is a promise that he would set up his kingdom one day. He's going to return and set up the kingdom one day. This was on their mind. This was on their heart. And as Jesus went into heaven, the angel told them, He's coming back one day. They could know that when He returned, they would be with Him. They had this promise, and we have this promise as well. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says there, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. And this was not just, this promise that is given to us here in verses 10 and 11, it's not just for this time period before the Holy Spirit would come. This is for all of their life. This is for the duration of the church age. This promise that while we wait on Jesus to come, remember, everything you're doing is for a purpose. The promise that Jesus would come again would give them the assurance that their mission was leading to something. That their lives and calling mattered toward God's intended end for human history. This is one of the many promises given to us in God's Word that impacts our lives on a daily basis. And we should live out these promises daily. We should remember these promises daily. Have you ever claimed a promise from God's Word? There's a lot of 
misunderstanding that goes along with talking about claiming a promise from God's Word, and I get all of that. There's people that abuse that, that type of thing and language and all of that, but what I mean is this. Have you ever read God's Word, something in God's Word just jumped out at you, and you said, God, I am claiming that for my life. You prayed for that. You trusted that. You said, God, this is for me, and I have faith that you're going to do it. That is claiming a promise from God. It's what Nehemiah did in chapter 1, verse 8. Remember when we studied Nehemiah several months ago? He said in chapter 1, verse 8, as he, as he heard the news that the walls in Jerusalem were torn down, he said there, God, remember the word you commanded your servant Moses. I'm telling you, folks, God wants us to call him to remembrance on some things. Now, God, not that God's forgotten anything at all. But when you call God to remembrance of something, that shows faith on your part. That you are believing the promises of God. Especially when you're going through a waiting experience. You need to know what God has promised you. You need to believe those promises for your own life. God will never do something different than what He has promised to do in His Word. So believe the promises of God. Well, they had received this promise. They would witnessed the ascension. They went back to Jerusalem to wait, as Jesus said to do in verse 4. And they didn't wait alone. It wasn't like they just all broke up and you know, went their separate ways. They were surrounded by other believers. Verse 15 tells us there was 120 believers gathered in this one place. So while you're waiting, remember this. Secondly, love the Lord's people. Love the Lord's people. Verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers." The Bible says they went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. That's the Mount called Olivet. They gathered in this upper room. Uh, this is not the one that we see Jesus and the disciples uh, having the Passover meal in. There's not much evidence that supports that. Probably just some place where they knew they could get alone together and, uh, and just fellowship with one another, uh, but not that place. All of these believers are eagerly attempt, uh, anticipating what would happen. Remember, they didn't know what the coming of the Holy Spirit was going to be like. I mean, Jesus had told them about it. Uh, he, had, he had said it's going to happen. Just wait for it. But they had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, they were just waiting. They were just obeying the Lord. And I want you to notice two things that they were doing. First of all, the Bible says they were in one accord. They were in one accord. In other words, they were unified. In this meeting together, they were unified. In John 13, verse 34 and 35, Jesus had given them, the Bible says, a new commandment to love one another as he had loved them. And by that, all people would know that they were his disciples. In John 17, just a couple of chapters beyond that, Jesus had, in the high priestly prayer, one of the main themes that goes through that prayer is his desire that his church would be unified around him. They were not right with him if they were not right with each other. And they committed to waiting this out together. You know, one thing that I've, I've seen since I've been a pastor is that many people get up upset with other church members simply because they're frustrated with God in their own lives. And it just kind of spills over in their actions with other people. It can cause dissension. It can cause difficulty. Uh, they can be irrational in some, thing, in, in some ways. And because they are frustrated over something going on in their own lives that has nothing to do with that person, they begin to cause dissension. I'm telling you, we're on a journey together. 
And we need each other. I think over the last few weeks, we have seen how badly we need each other. And praise God that we're going to be able to get back together very soon. We need each other, and we need to be united in our love for Jesus and in our love for one another. They were in one accord. Secondly, the Bible says they were praying. They were praying. Now, the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. We're going to look at that next time in in Acts chapter 2. That's Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes. But this is the first mention in the book of Acts of prayer. And it's a clue to where the church's power would come from. The prayer is mentioned 31 times and appears in 20 of 28 chapters in Acts. As the church prayed, they received the Spirit's power. If you were to venture back into the early church days and go talk to these Christians that lived their lives in the same time period the book of Acts was uh, being, uh, being written, you would understand they had a reliance upon the power of prayer. If you ask them, what was the key to being able to live for Christ? They would tell you it was the power of prayer. You know, prayer for them and for us is kind of like going into a gas station and getting refilled. I don't know about y'all, but I've been going to the gas station a lot lately because because I can get refilled. And it's not very expensive. And so, so when we go to the gas station, we get refilled. And we're able to do the things that we need to do. It's a refueling. And the Spirit empowered their lives. He he refueled their lives through prayer. And the same is true for us. That's why a day without prayer is a day without the power of God on your life. Steve Gaines goes as far to say that a day without prayer is a wasted day. Prayer enables us to receive from God all that he has for us in all the moments of life. It's not just true on an individual basis, though. It's it's also true on on a congregational basis. These folks right here are coming together. They're praying together as one accord. We're not going to be effective as a church if we're not praying together. Some of the sweetest times of fellowship in the church should be when we are praying together. Why is that? Because in those moments, unlike almost any other moment in our lives together, we are linked. We are agreeing. We are going before the throne of God in those moments to bring requests, to bring praises, to ask God to intervene. All kinds of things. We are united in our purpose for prayer. While you're waiting, you need to be united with God's people and praying with God's people so that you can love God's people. But a final thing I want you to see here is this. In your waiting, trust the Lord's providence. In verse 15 down through verse 26, let's read together. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with a record, with a reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was known was called in their own language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the Psalms, may his camp become desolate and, the, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all this time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, 
You know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So you see here in this meeting of the Lord's people that Peter stands up in the midst of the folks and he proclaims that they need to select someone to take Judas's place as the twelfth apostle. He bases this reasoning in Scripture. In verse 16, he talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit spoke through David. Now this is a, uh, a, a, a proof of the total inspiration of Scripture right here. Peter, right here, says the Holy Spirit, not just David, but the Holy Spirit spoke these words. And then he quotes Psalm 69, verse 25, and then he quotes Psalm 109 and verse 8. And Peter sees these scriptures as prophetic for this moment in time. For this moment, they were gathered together and needing to choose another apostle. He also knows that Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verses 28 to 30, that the apostles would sit on 12 thrones and they would judge the 12 tribes of Israel. If there's only 11 of them, they can't do that effectively, right? So they have to have a 12. So they lay down some qualifications about who will fill this spot. Had to be someone who was with them from the beginning through the ascension. They would become a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. That means not only that we, they, they saw the resurrection. Remember Paul tells us uh, <clears throat> over in 1 Corinthians 15 that over 500 people saw the resurrection. But they would also become a, test, a, a witness, a, a testifier to the resurrection. One who spoke of the resurrection of Jesus. This would become the standard right here of, of anyone who would become an apostle. That's how Paul, later on, we know, it becomes an apostle. You'll, you'll see that in chapter 9 as we get there in the book of Acts. But he becomes an apostle because he saw Jesus alive and he was commissioned to tell people about it, to be a witness to it. By the way, there are some ministers today who call themselves apostles. I want to let you know there are no such apostles today. This is the requirement for an apostle. They may be a brother or, or, a, uh, or, a, or a reverend or whatever they are, but they are not an apostle. These are the apostles. And there is these 12 and, of course, the apostle Paul. These were two men they put forward as candidates. Joseph, who we have a lot of information about uh, right here. We, his name is Justice. He's also called Barsabbas. And Matthias, who, who not much is said about. It could be that Matthias would, was possibly the most unlikely candidate of the two. We don't know. Uh, could have been that. They just didn't think he was going to be the one to be chosen. But God does things in, in ways that we don't think about sometimes. And Matthias was chosen. Could have been that. We don't know. But I want you to see that they, how, they, how they determined who would be chosen as the 12th apostle. First of all, they prayed. They prayed. They brought it before God. And secondly, they cast lots. Now this was similar to a dice roll or a coin flip. There were different ways of doing this in, in the Old Testament days. And so we don't know what they actually did, but it was similar to, some, to, to those things. A dice roll, a coin flip, something. Something that uh, you would think on the surface that it was by chance. But it was used many times in the Old Testament to determine God's will. You see this when they started dividing up the land, the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy, and, and in other places in the Old Testament, it was chosen by Lot. And God, God's will was revealed through all of that. Proverbs 16.33 says, The Lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So here they put this in God's hands by determining that whatever the Lot landed on, whoever the Lot landed on, was God's choice. This is the last time in Scripture that you see any casting of lots. Because in the next chapter, the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit is going to be the one to guide believers. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one to reveal God's will to the believers. But don't miss the fact they are trusting in the providence of God here. 
They know that however God wants to work it out is how it's going to be worked out. And the Bible says they cast the lot, and the lot fell on Matthias. The early church understood that God is a God of providence. That God was working out his purpose in this world. You come over to Acts chapter 4. In verse 24, and you see in their prayer, right after they had experienced the first persecution that they're going to experience, they're going to experience a lot of persecution for their faith. Right after that moment, when they knew that things would never be the same again, they get together and they pray. Listen to this prayer. And when they heard it, talking about the, the fact that things weren't going to be the same anymore, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Did you hear that? In their prayer, they said, all this was going on. <laughs> all of this chaos. But you know what it was? It was orchestrated by a sovereign Lord. And it was by his hand, and by his plan, that it was predestined to take place. What looked like a horrible human failure, from our perspective, from our understanding, was what God will from the beginning of, the of time. He was in control. Jesus' death was not a moment when God was out of control. God was in as much control in that moment as he ever has been over the events of the world. Because he knew that in three days, that tragedy that occurred on Good Friday would turn into the triumph of the resurrection. And God willed it, and God purposed it to happen just that way. Providence in your life and mine is possible. Because God is a sovereign Lord. He is working through any and all situations in our lives to bring about glory for himself and good for us. So let me just say to you, if you were waiting on God, if you're going through a dry spell, if you're anticipating something and you're not sure how it's going to turn out, you trust God in whatever way He leads you because He's sovereign over all things. And He is providentially working in your life. That's what they did in these moments of waiting. They didn't know how long they'd have to wait. They didn't even really know what they were waiting on other than the fact that Jesus said the Holy Spirit's going to come. But God was waiting, or it was calling them to wait, because he knew he was going to bring something good into their lives. And that happens in chapter 2, we see that. Whenever God calls us to wait, he's working. Whenever God calls us to wait, he wants us to learn some things. Whenever God calls us to wait, it's an opportunity to build our faith and our trust in him. So don't miss those opportunities to wait. One hot afternoon, a woman walked to her neighbor's produce stand. She was looking to buy some grapes. The line was quite long, and each person that was in front of her seemed to get special attention. She waited patiently. And when she finally made it to the front of the line, the uh, produce stand manager said, uh, what can I do for you? And she said, I'd like to buy some grapes. And he said, okay, excuse me for a minute. And he was gone for a, quite a long time. She had waited in, in line for longer than she thought she needed to. And now this guy says, I'll be back in a little bit. And so she got a little bit frustrated. She um, was thinking about even leaving. 
But not long after that, those thoughts running through her mind, he returned with a smile on his face, and she, he said, here's your grapes. She said, taste one. And they were the best grapes that she had ever tasted. And she said, thank you, and I appreciate this. He said, I'm sorry that I kept you waiting, but I needed to get you the very best. How long have you been waiting in line? on God for him to get to your request how long have you been waiting in line on God to meet a need to solve a problem or to open a door whatever you do don't get out of line whatever you do don't stop praying don't stop believing the promises of God don't stop loving his people don't stop trusting his providence because God is doing something. God is bringing something into your life that is good for you. And it will glorify himself. If you don't know Christ, you don't have that promise in your life. And I'm telling you today that there's a God in heaven who is waiting on you to place your faith and your trust in Jesus. God's a long-suffering God, meaning that, that he, he gives us a lot of leeway. He gives us many opportunities, many chances. But you never know when that last chance is going to be. You never know when the waiting of God is, is over with. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so let me just ask you right now, there in your own home or wherever you are, to think about this. If I died right now, would I go to heaven? In my own heart, do I know Jesus as Lord and Savior? And if the answer is no, then right now in this moment, you can place your faith and your trust in Jesus. The one who died for you on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later rose to life everlasting and ascended into heaven. And right now, he's calling on you to place your faith in him. Will you do it? There's going to be some numbers on the screen here in just a second. And let me just tell you, we'd love to be able to talk with you. We'd love to be able to pray with you about anything in your life, anything going on in your heart. If it may be to trust Jesus for the very first time, we want to, we want to know about that. We want to lead you through that. Maybe just to encourage you. Maybe just to encourage you in these days as you're waiting on something and you've grown frustrated and you're questioning and all that. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. However it is we might be able to counsel with you today, let us know that in this invitation time.
Well, everybody, we sure appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much over these past several weeks for being so supportive of all that we've been doing. Looking forward so much to next Sunday. We'll be uh, uh, just sharing some things throughout the week. Of course, the devotionals will continue on. Um, apologize about our Sunday school lesson this past week. Uh, we recorded one, but just never could get the upload. Oh, okay, it is uploaded. All right, just found that out. So, so get on the uh, Facebook page and check that out uh, for our Sunday school lesson this week. Uh, as I said, the devotionals will continue for the foreseeable future. We'll, we'll keep doing that and uh, just, just excited about uh, what God's going to do as we get back together in the days to come. God bless you. Have a great Mother's Day. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful today for this opportunity to worship together. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings to us. Father, we thank you so much for your word that encourages us and challenges us, comforts our hearts. And Lord, we pray today that you would just continue to work in our lives, Lord. Make us more like Jesus each day. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.